Good morning, Barrenuda Community Church. I thank God for the opportunity to share the word with you today. Next week, we will be teaching on Genesis from chapter 12 onwards. So we thought today we would do some revision from Genesis 1 to 11. I want to look at Genesis 1 to 11 through the eyes of biblical theology. Some of you might be thinking, does that mean teaching theology from the Bible? Well, kind of. Or maybe you're thinking, is biblical theology good theology as opposed to unbiblical theology? No, that's not what we're talking about. So what is biblical theology and why am I so excited about it? <laughs> well, biblical theology, theology helps us to see the whole Bible not as a library of 40 different books, but as one unified story with one purpose and one main message. The message is about what God is doing in the world through Jesus Christ. A little bit like God's big picture for those who've read that book. The whole Bible is really about Jesus and God's plans and purposes for him. Starting with Genesis right through to Revelation, everything in the Bible is preparing and leading us to Christ and then revealing and explaining Christ to us so that we can be joined to Christ as we move forward to the final stage where we will be living forever in a perfect place with Jesus as our King. So how does the Bible do this? Well, it does it, it, does it through stories. Through all these stories, God has written into his book a number of central themes that run from the beginning of the Bible right to the very end. Some of these themes are a garden. The Bible starts with the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve rebel and are banished from the garden. Later, Jesus, in another garden, submits to his Father's will. And that opens the way for us to enter into the garden city described in Revelation with the tree of life. Another theme is wilderness. Adam and Eve were banished into the wilderness and they must wait for God's promise of rescue. Israel was sent into the wilderness for 40 years where they were tested and trained to live as God's people. Jesus was tempted in the wilderness and he passed in every way that Israel failed. We as Christians live in the wilderness right now as we await for the return of our King to bring us into the true promised land. Another theme is sacrifice. Animals were sacrificed to cover Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Abraham, instead of sacrificing his son Isaac, sacrifices a lamb that God provides him. Then God taught Abraham's descendants to sacrifice a lamb as payment or atonement for their own sin, which pointed to Jesus, of which John the Baptist said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This lamb died on the cross for the forgiveness of sins and is now in heaven where living creatures and the elders are surrounding him saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and glory and honour and praise. We could mention the temple or covenant or kingdom. There are many other themes. As we see these themes running through the Bible, they help us understand who Jesus is and God's plans and purposes for him. These themes help, us, help to guide us into the Holy Spirit intended meaning of the text. So often we put our meaning into the text, but we need to ask, what is God saying to us? We can look at culture, word meanings, and historical backgrounds, these are helpful, but we need biblical theology because God is telling one big story from Genesis to Revelation and we need to interpret every small story in the light of this. <clears throat> biblical theology is different to systematic theology. Systematic theology chooses a topic and asks, what does the Bible have to say about this topic? Both are good, but I would suggest to you we won't really understand these topics as well as we could if they are not studied in the light of biblical theology. You see, biblical theology looks at the theme and follows it right through from Genesis to the Law and Prophets to the Gospels and Letters 
and then on to Revelation. We look at how that theme is developed, finding its climax in Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection, and, and then how this theme is consummated in the new creation. One of my favourite themes in the Bible starts in Genesis 3.15, which says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Genesis 3.15 is a central theme to the whole Bible. Now this verse has nothing to do with people hating snakes, but explains why there is conflict between the people of God and the rest of the people of the world. More than that, it announces the conflict between Satan and Jesus. And it points to the gospel, where the seed or the descendant of the woman will crush the head of the serpent and the serpent's seed. This theme starts in this verse like a little acorn, and it grows into a huge oak tree. It climaxes at the cross, and it will be consummated in the new heavens and the new earth. Genesis 3.15 are words that God says to the serpent who deceived Eve in the garden. Now in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Greek word for serpent used here is draken. It doesn't mean a creature with wings and claws that can breathe fire, but it does mean a monstrous snake or serpent. This serpent, Satan, has two strategies. He either deceives, or he devours. When the Bible talks about him deceiving, it calls him a serpent. When it talks about him devouring, it calls him a dragon. He wants to deceive and devour Eve's descendants. You could summarize the story of the whole Bible as kill the dragon, get the girl. Most kids like to hear a good dragon slaying story. Well, that is the main storyline of the Bible. In the Bible, the serpent or dragon, the Satan obviously, the damsel in distress or the girl, is the people of God, the church. The hero is Jesus. He's the dragon killer. The story starts with a damsel in a beautiful garden in a brand new world. That damsel is Adam and Eve enjoying the Garden of Eden. The serpent sneaks into the garden and deceives he lies and tempts Adam and Eve to disobey God's word. The serpent succeeds in turning that beautiful garden into a howling wilderness. But a promise of hope and rescue is given to Adam and Eve and all those who come after them. Wait. Wait for the serpent slayer. As the story develops, the serpent alternates his attacks between deceiving and devouring. Sometimes he tries to deceive God's people with false teaching. And other times he attacks God's people with violent persecution. At the climax of the story, the dragon tries to devour the hero, which is Jesus, who's come to rescue the damsel. The dragon murders Jesus on a cross, but all he ends up doing is bruising Jesus' heel because Jesus comes back to life. Meanwhile, Jesus defeats the dragon by decisively crushing the serpent's head. For the rest of the story, the dragon furiously tries to devour the damsel. In a rage, he keeps trying to deceive and destroy the church. The hero's mission is to kill the dragon and get the girl. He will succeed. In Revelation, Jesus will consummate his kingdom for God's glory by destroying the dragon and saving his bride. And they'll all live happily ever after in a beautiful garden city. This is one way to summarise the story of the Bible. Isn't it a great story? <laughs> Biblical theology unlocks the Bible for us in a way that makes it wonderful and amazing and more satisfying than anything else in this world. Jesus' disciples didn't really understand the Old Testament. It was full of mystery and unfulfilled promises. Clearly God had spoken to them in its pages, but it was a mystery and a bit confusing until the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus unlocks all the mystery in the Old Testament. And by mystery, I don't mean something impossible to understand. The Bible uses the word mystery to mean something that was hidden, but is now revealed. Luke tells us in chapter 24 what happened the day Jesus rose from the grave. 
He joined two of his disciples as they were walking along the road to Emmaus, feeling confused and down about Jesus being killed on a cross. The first thing Jesus tells them is that all the Old Testament scriptures are all about him. Luke 24, 25-27, we read it earlier, it says, He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Jesus told his disciples they hadn't believed everything that the prophets had said about him. How did Jesus explain to them who he is and what he has done? He taught them the Old Testament. Moses and the prophets and the Psalms are all about Jesus. So then in Luke 24, 45, he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Jesus unlocked the Old Testament and helped his disciples interpret it in the light of who he is and what he has done. What Jesus means is that the entire Old Testament, not only individual verses and passages or prophecies point to Jesus, the whole Old Testament points to Jesus as the climax of God's plans. As we read the book of Acts, we find Peter and the disciples preaching and teaching uh, Jesus and understanding how Jesus fulfilled all the Old Testament. The New Testament is full of quotations from the Old Testament and explanations to help us understand those quotes. We need all of God's Word. You can't really understand the Old Testament properly without the New, and you won't really understand the New properly without the Old. Biblical theology makes Jesus Christ the centre of all Bible teaching and study. We are often so self-focused that when we read the Bible, we come looking for what does it mean to me? Or how does this affect me? Or what do I need to do? God's Word does change us and it does have meaning for us. But first and foremost, it's about Jesus. When we understand God's story and themes, then we stop trying to make the Bible fit with us and use it for our life. We see the big story and we become part of God's big plan and purpose. When biblical theology is part of our study and teaching, we walk away not self-focused, not with a whole list of things that we have to try and do, <laughs> but we leave in awe and wonder of Christ and encourage once again to put our faith and trust in him. Well, let's revise some of the stories in Genesis 1-11. to I'm going to focus on a few themes or patterns that continue right through the Bible. We'll look at the four major stories in these chapters. First, let's look at Genesis 3, about the fall. In God's garden, where his people live, an enemy enters to deceive. Adam and Eve listen to the serpent, they disobey God, and then God visits them in judgment and salvation. First, we see the curse on the serpent. Genesis 3.14 says, Cursed are you, talking to the serpent. Second, we see judgment on Adam and Eve. In chapter 3, 16 to 19, God tells Adam and Eve they will have painful toil and labour. For Eve, it is in God's design of her being a wife and a mother. For Adam, it is in God's design of him being a provider and protector. In verse 23, God banishes them from the Garden of Eden. But then we see a promise of salvation and grace. At the same time God is bringing judgment, he is also showing his grace and promising salvation. Um, 3.15, as we've already mentioned, we see that there will be enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. But a seed, or a descendant of Eve, will crush the head of the serpent. We have the promise of redemption. And then we see in verse 21 that God graciously provides clothing for Adam and Eve to cover their nakedness, which actually points to the sacrifice of the serpent crusher, Jesus. Moses, who writes the book of Genesis, 
tells the stories in a way that looks for that promised descendant of the woman. As Moses wrote about new generations that are born and looks at the life of different characters, there is this question. Is he the one? Is he the one to slay the serpent and undo the curse of the garden? Let's have a look at the next story, the story of Cain and Abel in Genesis 4. For the first readers of Genesis, they'll be looking for the offspring of the woman who is going to rescue them from the curse. Is it Abel? Is it Cain? In verse 5, it says, God did not look on Cain with favour, and Cain was very angry and downcast. Verse 6, God warned Cain that sin was crouching at his door and desired to have him. But Cain didn't listen. And in verse 8, he invited his brother to go with him out into the fields where he attacked and killed Abel. In verse 9, God visits Cain in judgment and grace. Verse 11, he says, You are under a curse, or cursed are you. God repeats the same words of curse to Cain that he said to the snake in Genesis 3. In Hebrew, they're exactly the same words. Moses has just told us there will be enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, and here we have the first example of it. God's words to Cain tell us that Cain, the murderer, shows himself to be the seed of the serpent. And Abel, the first righteous man, a seed of the woman, is martyred for his faith. God judges Cain. In verse 12, God says to Cain, You will be a restless wanderer. And Cain now lives with the fear of death. But we also see God's grace. In verse 15, where God puts a mark on Cain so that no one would kill him. And then in verse 25, God gives Adam and Eve another son called Seth in place of Abel. So we have hope again for God's promise or in Genesis 3.15 of the serpent crusher. In Genesis chapter 6 to 9, we have the story of Noah. Noah is in the line of Seth. In, in Genesis 5.28, it says about Noah, He will comfort us in the labour and painful toil of our hands caused by the ground the Lord has cursed. You see, there is hope and expectation that this boy... Noah will reverse the curse. Is he the snake crusher? The story of Noah in Genesis 6 starts with, The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Isn't that an awful picture? But I don't think my heart was any better before the Lord rescued me. Verse 13 and again in verse 17 we see that God visited the people in judgment. He says, I'm going to put an end to all people and I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heaven. But God also visits in grace and salvation. Verse 18, God says to Noah, I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife. And God says to bring in every kind of animal too. Now, I want you to understand what the stakes are in this situation. We know that God's character is holy and righteous and just. He must punish sin. If he doesn't, he will not be true to himself. But if God does destroy all rebellious people, as we all deserve, Satan succeeds in seeing God's creation destroyed. But God must be true to his character. And God is also a God of love, grace and forgiveness. To be true to himself, he must forgive. But if God just overlooks all sin and evil, Satan still gets what he wants. Because now sin doesn't matter. We can do whatever we want because there's no consequence. Satan's evil ways are accepted. So how can God deal with this problem and still be true to his character, all of his character? Well, he does it by doing both at the same time. He judges and saves at the same time. We can see that clearly in the story of Noah and the flood. 
the waters that destroyed the earth are the same waters that floated the ark safely above all the destruction. The ark even shows us a picture of who Jesus is. As we are in Christ, we find safety from the judgment of God. Was Noah the snake crusher? Sadly, no. The end of the story has him naked, covered in shame, drunk from misusing fruit, and the curses continue. It's a lot like what happened in the garden. This brings us to the last of the four stories in Genesis 1-11. to This is the story of the Tower of Babel. Uh, chapter 11 verse 4 says, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we can make a name for ourselves. But in verse 5, the Lord came down and he visited them in judgment and grace. Uh, verses 8, uh, 7 and 8, God judges them as he confuses their language so they will not understand each other. They stopped building the city and were scattered over the face of the whole earth in verse 9. At first it's not obvious where God's grace is in this story. But if you read on into chapter 12, you will find God's grace. Uh, so far, God's judgment in Genesis has meant that people are under a curse, people are banished and scattered, people are separated, and there's enmity between them. Then in Genesis 12, we see God's grace and plan for salvation. God chooses Abraham, and through Abraham and his descendant, God will bless all people. Through Abraham and his descendant, God will make one nation, one people. Through Abraham and his descendant, God will bring his people to live in his land, his place. God is continuing to bring about his promise of a serpent crusher. And God continues to reveal the fulfillment of this promise throughout Genesis as we learn more about Abraham's family, Isaac, Jacob and Joseph. We'll also see that God will continue to visit all people in judgment and grace. This theme of judgment and grace continues right through the Old and the New Testament, finding its climax at the cross and its consummation in the book of Revelation. We can see it in the Exodus story, when God saves Israel from slavery under Pharaoh in Egypt, as he judges the Egyptian gods and the Egyptian people, God visits the Egyptian people in death, killing their firstborn sons. That same night, God saves his people through the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. The same Red Sea that parted and saved Israel, judged and killed Pharaoh's army. As Israel entered the promised land and defeated the city of Jericho, God is judging the Canaanites and yet saving a prostitute, Rahab. In the exile, God judges his people for their sin and they are sent into Babylon. And at the same time, God sends prophets to speak of God's grace and plan to restore them, to bring them back. So judgment and salvation run parallel and they climax at the cross. At the cross, Jesus, who is the long-awaited seed of the woman, decisively crushes the head of the serpent by God visiting us in judgment and salvation. God judges Jesus and saves us. At the cross, God, who is holy, righteous and just, judged and punished sin. Romans 3, 25, 26 says, God presented Christ as an atonement... Uh, on, let me start again. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. On the cross, God demonstrated his righteousness. He punished sin. He is just in punishing sin. And yet at the cross, we see God's love, grace and forgiveness. God punished sin at the cross, but he didn't punish you and I. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, 
so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's 2 Corinthians 5.21 So Jesus took our place and received the punishment for sin. Jesus became cursed and he died. But through faith in him, we receive salvation and grace. Ephesians 1 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. At the cross, God showed his judgment and salvation through Jesus. He also defeated the serpent. Colossians 2 14 15, God forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness. In indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And, having disarmed the power and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. God's judgment and salvation will come to consummation when Jesus returns. Jesus will judge the earth. In Revelation 20 we read, The books are opened, and people are judged according to what they had done. Anyone whose name was not written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. And in Revelation 21, those whose names are written in the book of life will be accepted into the new creation, living face to face with God. Jesus brings judgment and Jesus brings salvation for those who have trusted and put their faith in him. And we see in Revelation 20, Jesus destroys the serpent. Uh, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur. In the end, Jesus defeats the dragon, gets the girl, his bride, the church, and they do live happily ever after. Jesus does this through judgment and salvation. These two actions reveal the nature of God and the way he deals with us. If I asked you, is judgment good? Many might say no. <laughs> Many people try to separate judgment and salvation by overlooking or overemphasizing God's different attributes. Many people like to say God is the God of judgment in the Old Testament and that Jesus is the God of grace in the New Testament. But this kind of God is not the God of the Bible. You see, judgment and grace or salvation go together because that is who God is. That is how he saved us at the cross. Is this challenging you? It should be. It means God is not a domesticated God that you can pick and choose his attributes. God is who he is. He is the I am. And we need all of his word from Genesis to Revelation to know and understand who God reveals himself to be. He does this expressly through Jesus Christ, whom he has spoken of and pointed to since creation. Nothing will increase your joy and wonder at your salvation and the grace God has shown you in Christ than by looking humbly at the holiness and wrath of God as he judges sin. You won't properly appreciate your salvation if you don't know what you've been saved from. Jesus is the serpent crusher, the long-awaited fulfilment of the promise God gave in Genesis 3.15. Jesus kills the dragon and he gets the girl. The question is, are you his girl? For anyone who was listening careful might have noticed that I made a mistake early in my talk. I mentioned the Bible having 40 different books. That's not true. It has 66 uh, written by 40 different authors. Um, I want to give a little plug for this Bible. If you've been, uh, if I've whet your appetite for, for biblical theology and you'd like to study more, this Bible is awesome. I've got my kids using it. I know other people in the church are using it. Uh, you can get it from Kurong. It's a great Bible. Um, and also, if you really like the story about the, 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 the dragon killer, there's a great little book. You can buy it from Kurong as well. Um, it's uh, uh, biblical theology 
uh, about the theme of the serpent. Uh, very interesting. Conan's read it. If you want to hear more about it, he loved it. So um, let me close our time with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for um, your word. It's amazing the, the things that are hidden away in there that are revealed as we study more and more about your word. Thank you for your great plan of salvation that there's only one way that you could uh, deal with sin and yet not destroy the sinner and that is by taking it on yourself judgment and salvation together at the same time lord we thank you that we are those who uh, experience this in our lives and we we love you we thank you and we want to continue growing as your people we look forward to the day when you come to take us away from this broken world where we'll be your bride we will live forever with you in that wonderful garden city. It's such a wonderful hope to look forward to and, and yeah, we just want to say thank you and keep the rest of our uh, day to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thank you everyone. <laughs>